I don't know I wasn't hit in here this morning when the first time was in, introduced, but I don't know if you were aware that we had two young men from Korea here with us today. They've been going to school here in the country. And one reason I mention it is because they're leaving tonight for North Carolina. And then Tim is going to fly back from North Carolina to Los Angeles. Oh, delightful day. I told him I used to be young and ignorant like that. <laughs> Make all kinds of wild trips like that, but no more. But uh, they came to visit us, and they, uh, they got a hold of some of the books, and got them stirred up, they decided this might be a little different from the ordinary church. Now be different tonight. It's an order. <laughs> and praise the Lord. You know, you have a choice to make as far as the Lord's concerned, as far as your life's concerned, and nobody can make that choice but yours. And that's what this song's all about. <clears throat> I can be strong, I can be brave, I can be free or be a slave. I can forgive as he forgave, the choice is mine. I can go through in storm or gale, I can be true or I can fail, I can desert or set my sail, the choice is mine. If I would live, then I must die and bid this fleeting world goodbye. Its treasures dear, I must deny, the choice is mine. I'll walk by faith where I am led, it matters not what lies ahead. And if my path be crimson red, the choice is mine. I can have faith, I can have fear, I can believe that God is near, or I can doubt the things I hear, the choice is mine. I can draw close, or I can stray, I can submit, or go my way within my heart I hear him say the choice is mine if I the king of heaven choose if I the things of earth refuse the best I gain the worst I lose the choice is mine because he gave his life for me because of love at Calvary I take him for eternity the choice is mine <coughs> going to be facing choices all your life from the time you're young until you get older and there never will be a time when you won't face a choice and the choices do not get any easier as you get older you thought they did didn't you you thought the hardest ones would be when you were young and you had so much to choose from but things vary and change but the choices are still difficult and you still have to choose whether you'll serve the Lord or whether you'll walk with the world. And what you do determines what you'll have in eternity. It also determines what kind of life you'll live here. You can live in absolute misery and pain and suffering and scrambling here, or you can have peace, you can have some victory, you can have slam-bang battle. 
Or you can just have slam bang battle and misery and torment and slam bang battle and misery and torment and slam bang battle and misery and torment. It's just up to you. I prefer to have some victory along with it or some peace and joy and then also put some things in first national heaven because that's where it's all going to pay off. You're not going to live here long. Right now you think that uh, you're going to live forever, but you're not. 80, 90 years, you're going to check out if you last that long. And then what will you do? Where's your bank account? Well, the choice is yours. I hope you make the right choice. God has his best things for those who dare to test, stand the test. God has his second best for those who will not have his best. I want in this short life of mine as much as may be pressed of service true to God and man. Lord, help me to have thy best. I hope you'll choose God's best. It's not an easy road, but it's the best one. My Bible tells me the way of transgressor is hard, so the devil's lying when he tells you it's easier to go this way. It is not easier. It only looks that way until you get involved in it and can't get out, and then, then it gets hard. Let's go back to Exodus again. We were having a good time this morning. We didn't get very far in it, but we're going back at it again. This time we're going to get the smoke off the mountain anyway. Exodus chapter 19 is where we were. In verse 23, God had warned Moses, the people do not dare come up to the mountain uh, because uh, they... Uh, they might perish and the Lord might break forth upon them and the uh, they set bounds about the mount and they said don't let anybody come through except the ones God says to now verse uh, 1 of chapter 20 God spoke all these words I am the Lord thy God which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage and thou shalt have no other gods before me thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that's in heaven above in earth beneath or in the water under the earth thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. People who get snared in demon worship and idol worship go down the, the ladder that's pictured over in Romans chapter 1. Idolatry has a progression about it. Uh, the first idols are made like unto man, which are like the supreme creation that God made. And so the first idols are like men. And then they become like four-footed creatures, getting a little lower. Then they finally become like reptiles, well, they become like birds, then four-footed things, then creeping things. So snake worship, worship of reptiles is the bottom of the ladder. And in all these things, Sexual immorality and sex perversion is offered as worship to these false gods. This is true in all heathen religions. I don't know how aware you of it are of it, but it's true. And God says he'll not have it. He's a jealous God. He will visit the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. A generation's 40 years. Three generations, 120 years, four generations, 160 years of curses and the visiting of God's iniquity on those who transgress this thing. And were it not for the grace of God, were it not for the power of Jesus Christ to break these curses and relieve the sins of the fathers, it would really be a dismal picture indeed. For these curses, once set in motion in the Old Testament, were not relieved. Only in the New Testament are the curses able to be broken. When the curses set in motion on David's family, 
there was nothing could stop them from going to full fruition. We have something far superior to that under the new covenant in Jesus Christ, whereby we are able to take care of this. He said, I'll show, visit iniquity of the fathers to the children of the third and fourth generation that hate me. But he also said, I'll show mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. It pays to have a godly heritage. If you didn't have one, you get busy and scrub up the one you've got, get it cleaned up, get the demons out of it, and then you give to your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren, you give them a godly heritage because God said, I'll visit mercy on those that love me to thousands that love me. So it's not just a bleak picture of only curses and iniquity visited. It's also mercy and grace visited on the descendants of those who serve the God. And if you don't care anything about yourself, you ought to care about your kids. And you ought to care about your grandkids and your great-grandkids. You say, well, it's not fair. I didn't get a very good heritage. Well, don't, start, don't sit around sucking your thumb about that. Because a lot of people didn't have a good heritage. But you don't, if you sit around and just suck your thumb about it, then you're being very stupid because God has given a way to get free from that, to break those curses, cut those soul ties, and to get out from under that and to give yourself and your descendants a fresh start and a fresh look at God. And I say it's worthwhile just for your descendants to get things straight with God. Don't you think so? <clears throat> He said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. This is an interesting commandment. You know, the Lord's name now is bandied around quite frequently. I can remember when the movie Gone with the Wind came out, and when they had one little expletive at the end of the movie, it shook the whole country. Now they talk gutter language all the time on TV, movies, out in the streets, in the schoolyards, and everywhere else. And they don't think anything about it. They use gutter language. Now remember this, profanity, foul language, dirty language, is the crutch of conversational cripples. People who are so pitifully and abysmally ignorant and stupid that they cannot express themselves in English, resort to little four-letter words because their tiny little minds can't grasp anything any bigger. And so they began to spit out little four-letter words, revealing their excessive stupidity, dumbness, ignorance, mediocrity, imbecility, let me see what else, a moronic type language. Are you getting the idea that I don't care for dirty language? You're right. I not only don't like it, I detest it. It's a sign of ill breeding. Anytime you children open your mouth and start blabbing with the language of the gutter, everybody that listens, you think, my, where were their mother and daddy? You say, well, wait a minute, my mother and daddy didn't teach me that. Well, that's what people think. They think you learned it at home. So if you want to you honor your, and you know the Bible says to honor your father and your mother. When you open your mouth and start blistering out with some of this filthy language just because you think it's cute or smart, I've got news for you. You're not honoring your father and your mother. And God gets you hide for that. You clean up your language. A lot of people, when they get saved, they lose half their vocabulary. And they should. Nowadays, they just keep on using it. But you need to dump it overboard. Don't use the name of God as an expletive. Oh, God, what will I do? Well, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Get out of the habit of using God's name. He said, don't take my name in vain. Don't cast it around as something cheap, something you walk on. And without realizing, we picked up the mores of our society which is about the mores of a pig pen, and we have cast the name of our God around. You know, a lot of people never did know um, that God's last name wasn't damn until they got saved. 
because I never heard them separated. You know, it was always, they were always together. Some people, unfortunately, don't hear the name of Jesus except Jesus Christ. As that, now that's taking the Lord's name in vain and he'll not hold the person guiltless that does that. And if your little children hear you using that kind of language, they're going to pick it up. You say, well, I've heard it here in the church. Well, when you hear it coming out of the mouths of demons, even the little children are smart enough to figure out where it's coming from. It's coming from demonic sources and it comes out that that's where it's coming from from you too. If you have a habit of popping out with nasty talk, you need deliverance immediately, if not sooner. You say, well, if I lose my temper, I wouldn't brag about it. Nobody else wants it. Don't throw it around. Nobody else is interested in having your temper. You need to get rid of those evil spirits that make you cast God's name around as a common and dirty thing. Because he said, don't you do it. Don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Had a day of rest set apart. Said, you better keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. The seventh day is the Sabbath. The Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, nor thy son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, cattle, nor a stranger in thy gates. For in six days God, the Lord made heaven and earth see all that in them is rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. That's a strange thing. During World War II, they had the war factories running. Year, they were running 24 hours a day. And of course, the idea was to turn out as much production as humanly possible in the shortest possible time. So they tried various intervals. Efficiency experts came in and set up teams and they began to uh, check the workers and they put workers on various schedules that have them work two days and one day off, that have them work three days and one day off, and right on down the line. They checked all kinds of various intervals uh, to see how long and where the workers' efficiency peaked and where they began to lose efficiency. You know what happened? The workers' efficiency ran just fine as long as they worked six consecutive days. And then they were off one, the seventh day, when they got off the seventh day. But if they worked eight days, or they worked seven days and then were off eight, on that seventh day it was, unpro it was counterproductive because the efficiency rate plunged. And the longer they worked past that seventh day, the worse it became. So you know what they figured out? The best interval is six days of work and one day off. And that produces my, well, that's, that makes sense. You know, here we have the, uh, owner, we have the uh, manufacturer's manual right here. He made man. And here he gives instructions for maximum efficiency. They'll work six days and then they'll rest one. So what they did with all their expensive studies, they came back to find out what they could have found out in the Bible the best interval is to work six days and be off one. Now, look a little further. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The We live in a day where fathers and mothers are not honored, where parents are not honored, and where it's difficult to honor various creatures called fathers and mothers for the simple reason they've degraded themselves. But nevertheless, a child is told to honor the father and mother. To honor the father and mother does not mean an abject obedience to them no matter what they do or say. But you can honor your, uh, well, some people come to me and they say, well, you know, I want to honor my, my father and my mother but I'm grown, I have a home of my own, and they, they're not Christians, they don't understand, and they tell me, well, you should do this and you should do that, and am I dishonoring them when I refuse to do what I know is stupid and, and against what the Lord says? No, you're not dishonoring them. The way you handle that, you listen carefully to what they say, realizing that though they may be mistaken in what they're advising, they are, 
they love you and they want to help. And so you give them credit for that and you love them and you respectfully listen to what they say and you say, well, do I have to do it? No, sir. You can tell them respectfully, I really thank you for telling me this. I'm going to pray about it and then I'll try to do what the Lord says. Now you've honored your father and mother and yet you're not obligated yourself to do anything unless God tells you to do it. You say, well, they don't like it. Well, then they'll just have to get where they do because you don't, you don't have to obey them in every jot and tittle when you're out. Now, as long as you're living under their roof, let me back up a minute. You're living under their roof. You're eating their food. Oh, we have a different story now. Yes, you will pay great attention to what they say. And the moment you can walk out the door and, and buy all the food that goes on your table and buy all the gas that goes in your car and buy your car and pay for all the things you get, then you can move to the status I just talked about. But as long as they are buying your food, buying your shelter, buying your clothes, buying everything for you, then you owe them an extra measure of respect and even obedience. <laughs> Now, if you don't like obedience, then I'd suggest that you pray and ask the Lord to hit you with a bunch of money so you move out and have your own place. And then you can act like a fool if you want to. But parents have a right when they're paying the bills. Well, you know, children sometimes in this day and age, they have this attitude, just pay the bills and shut up, old man. I'll make the bills, you pay them. Whatever gave you the right to have the say-so about this house just because you're making all the payments and paying all the utility bills. Why can't I turn the lights on all night long if I want to? Why can't I walk out and leave it like I want to? Even if it is a pig pen. Nobody coming. Why does Mama want to be so fussy? Well, if she wants to be fussy, then you get in there and straighten it out. And if, she, and if they don't, Papa, get the stick after them. You say, well, they're too big to hit, the, hit with a stick. Show them where the door is. If they sit outside a while, they'll change their tune. They might decide it'd be better to clean up the room than to sit outside. I let them sit on the doorstep. You know, you don't want them to sit on the place where the rain will blow in on them in case it's raining. So they'll remember they're sitting out there. <clears throat> We've got to come to a place where we recognize there are some rules and regulations and all this rebellion of the age is out of style with God. And if you don't honor your father and mother, God's going to get your hide for it. He said, well, I can get around mom and daddy. You might well do that, but you'll never get around God. He'll get you for it. Thou shalt not kill. And that puts a stop to abortion, doesn't it? They say, well, when does it become a baby? The moment the sperm unites with the egg. How's that? Thou shalt not kill. That means you're not supposed to run out here and knock everybody in the head just because you get mad. Now, of course, we have a lot of people, you know, saying, well, we believe in moderation. You know, you're supposed to drink moderately. Don't just make a pig of yourself and drink uh, three or four gallons a night. Just drink a quart or so, you know. No, don't, be, don't just drink everything in sight. Well, you can put the same slide rule, you know, on, uh, on killing. Don't kill, let's kill moderately. Don't kill everybody you meet. Just uh, kill somebody about once a month. You know, re restrain yourself. Don't, don't just go hog wild and shoot everybody you meet. Just once in a while, pick somebody else that you especially don't like. Isn't that ridiculous? No, when God puts up absolute rules, you have to go by those rules. And thou shalt not commit adultery, that's sexual impurity, and that is a no-no, and there's no way it can be justified. You know, people run around making all kinds of little justifications. A lot of times, you know, you have people saying, well, I couldn't help it, liar. God made me this way. Okay. 
you use that excuse and you're stuck with it. You know where that came from? Garden of Eden, book of Genesis. Hmm? Eve looked and saw the fruit was good. God gave her the eyes. It must have been his fault. And remember when Adam ate the fruit? God said, why would you eat the fruit? He said, it's really your fault, this woman thou gavest me. Boy, that old excuse hadn't run out of soap yet either, has it? Well, it's really my wife's fault. I'd really be a humdinger if it wasn't for my wife. Yeah, you probably would. You'd have probably humdinged off the, off the socket already. No, you're not going to be able to blame God for creating the problem that you've got. If you want to know where it came from, look over in the book of James. When you want to really, when you want to really get rough on yourself, when, you, when you've been real nasty and hateful to God and hateful to everybody around you, and you need a good purgative. Do you know what a purgative is? Some of you are looking blank like you don't know. I might have to explain it to you. When you need x lax or castor oil or some such dreadful thing, <laughs> when I was growing up, they had some, I guess they still got it, phenomint. It looks like little chiclets. It tastes like peppermint gum. But I got news for you. If you chew it, kid gets a mouthful of that thing and he's got peppermint gum, he's going to have something worse than that before it's over with. <laughs> Listen. God wants to clean us up and make us meet for the master's use. He doesn't want us to go around blaming him for everything. This woman thou gavest me. This body you gave me. I can't help it. I just felt like doing it. Well, pigs feel like falling head over heels and trough of slop and eating that. Why don't you try that? I mean, you're going to do everything you feel like. How ridiculous. You don't do everything you want. And then you have people, you know, they tell me, well, you know, I just can't control my children. And you think, you know, they were big strapping six-footers, you know, the way they're carrying on about it. And you say, well, which one is it? Well, my boy, I just can't control him. You got visions of him being bigger than you are, you know. And he walks up and he's this big. <laughs> can't control him nothing. It's high time you got the controls. Because if you don't get them now, believe you me, you're not ever going to have them. Who's the biggest? And who was given charge over them? Well, they make me nervous. Well, they make everybody else nervous, too, if you don't discipline them. Did you ever look down the road and say, Oh, Lord, here comes Brad Ella. We use, I'm going to go way back. <laughs> you know, when you get on a touchy issue, you don't use current illustrations, ever. <laughs> this is something you learn in preaching. You, you go back a few years before, uh, before present company. BPC, before present company. We go back a few years. There actually used to be a family in our church. And we liked the people. But they had a boy that must have been the meanest boy in ten counties. And he made, I didn't know what he was making me do at that particular time because we weren't in deliverance. But he was making me manifest. <laughs> I wanted to pinch his head off right where it joined on to his body. <laughs> I figured it out specifically how it would be. That kid was the meanest thing. He must have been nine, ten years old. Any time 
that he came with his family to visit, and we liked the people, and we enjoyed visiting with them. But we dreaded seeing him come because we learned, and everybody in the church knew it, that if they came to visit you, and this punk, um, this child was with them, <laughs> this little beast was with them, you could mark it down that before they left, no matter how carefully you watched, something was going to be broken and torn up before that child got out of the house. And when I found out what it was, I wanted to break and tear up something on him, too. But I never got to do it, but I sure felt like it. And nobody wanted them to come and visit. They liked them, but if they would have staked him out in the yard, <laughs> the, the, the family would have been welcome. You know, you would have enjoyed it. But how can you relax when you know a monster like that's loose in your house? I remember we had all three of our kids trained from the time they were little not to be afraid of the dark. And they were little bitty fellows at the time when Monstrola came in. And uh, they, uh, so we had them trained. They would go upstairs in the dark room and go to bed. Lightning and thunder didn't bother them. They were, you know, they, it was dark up there, but there wasn't anybody up there but the Lord. So they weren't really afraid. Guess what? After this monster made a visit, he had them scared to death to go upstairs. I could have murdered him. I felt like killing him telling God he died. <laughs> There's no excuse for having a monster like that. Nobody likes them. And you can't give them to anybody. They're yours. <laughs> Nobody else wants them. <laughs> So if you're going to have to give them away, raise them up where they'll be sweet. And everybody said, oh, I'd like for them to stay at my house. And they say, oh, Lord, here they come again. <laughs> oh, my. Well, we didn't have as much trouble as some others. The horror stories we heard were worse than what happened at our house because I was mean. People say, well, you shouldn't correct a child at your house. If they get out of order, they'll get corrected. I look at Mama, I look at Daddy, and then I say, Cut that out. Put that down. Don't touch. It may leap off the wall and bite you. <laughs> I mean, that's stretching it just a mite, but I have had a few jump with that. <laughs> I remember this. This young man also had a beast of a sister, a little older. And they had thoughtfully... One time we were recounting our terrible woes to another family in the church that had known them longer than we had. And they said, oh, that's nothing. I said, nothing? I thought we'd just gotten the, the ultimate. And they said, no. Said one time they came over to our house and this lady had uh, some plants on a little glass stand, you know, about four tiers uh, high with little pot plants on it, you know. Guess what? The kids were so quiet, they never went to check on them. They were back in the kitchen, dumping all the pots on the floor. There was dirt all over the floor and plants. Oh, I, was, I said, thank you, Lord. Thou dost not put us through that which we could not stand. <laughs> well, I think I would have leaped on those children and put them out the door. Now, how did we get there? Oh, you shouldn't kill. Yeah, I guess you better not. <laughs> In spite of what they do, you can't kill them. <laughs> you can borrow the door and pretend you're not there when they come. <laughs> I don't know how we got way over there. Verse 15, thou shalt not steal. You know, by the way, let me stop here and, and tell you that when you're dealing with children, children need to be saved, little children in your neighborhood, maybe in your home, but especially children that are not in church and are not exposed to the gospel. Little children are very, very easy to win to the Lord. 
And there's a very, this, this verse, you say, well, how did you tie this in? I really did. And this really fits into it. Uh, if you are going to win a child to the Lord, all you really need is two verses. You need um, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God to establish the fact of sin. And you need Revelation 3.20 back here. <clears throat> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's all you need to win a child of the Lord. Now, it's not quite that simple. What you need to realize is that to a child, a very small child, a, the biggest appeal about salvation is going to heaven. So you don't say, hey, kid, you know you're going to hell? That's no way to approach a child. What you do first, you tell them that God has a beautiful home called heaven. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. It never is night there. And all kids hate the night because they have to go to bed. Never a kid living that wanted to go to bed. They want it to be, want to stay up. And in heaven, there's no night there. And there's no need for light because Jesus lights the whole place up. And it's never too hot. It's never too cold. And people never get sick there so they don't have any nasty medicine or old shots. Kids like that. I kind of like that myself. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, there's never any, there's no graveyards there because nobody ever dies in heaven. And there's no tears there because nobody, everybody is happy there. And then you tell them, wouldn't you like to go and live in God? And you know, and God wants you to come and live with him someday. Would you like to go some of these days and live with God? And the child would say, yeah. Sounds like a good deal. And then you tell them, but you can't go. Ooh, why not? Well, because... Your heart is dark with sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now to children, you don't discuss with them they're committing adultery and robbing banks and things of this sort. <clears throat> this is a little out of their reach. When you're dealing with children, there are definite sins that children can commit. And this will be enough to establish that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And this is what you need to have conviction for sin, which will cause a child to be able to reach toward the Lord. Now, children lie. And down here we're going to have the, that you're not supposed to bear false witness. And children steal. You say, how do they lie? Well, if you ask a child, do you, did you ever lie? They'll say, no. I was teaching a class of children one time. I had about 25 or 30 little boys and girls, and I had a flannel board, and I was going through this with them. And they were listening, you know, and I said, does anybody know what sin is? And one little girl nearly jerked her arm out of the joint. She was, must have been every bit of seven years old. She just, oh, boy, she was waving her hand. I said, what, is, what do you think it is? She said, it's something horrible no she's right it's pretty horrible but you see you ask a child did you ever lie no so you don't ask them that way you ask them did you ever tell something that wasn't just exactly the truth like your mother or daddy did. Like, you know, mama, mother came in and she said, who spilled this milk all over the kitchen? And you said, I don't know, but you did. Now there you see the child can grasp the idea, well, that's, that's not telling the truth and that's a lie. And God says that a lie is sin. Did you ever steal? No. 
never stole a car or radio or TV in their life. I mean, they saw Miami Vice. They know what stealing is. But did you ever take something that wasn't yours? Did you take somebody else's toy? Or did you go in and somebody's cookie was laying on the table and you said, oh, that looks good. And you took it and it was yours then because you ate it? <laughs> but now you see if you go that direction the child can begin to understand what it is to steal to take something to take something that isn't yours and children can understand lying they can understand stealing and also they can understand disobedience did you ever not do what your mother or your father told you to do they don't even give you a no on that one. But you see, that's sin in God's eye because he said, children, obey your parents. Now, those are three areas where children can understand the fact of sin. Don't try to convict them on things that big folks get involved with. Stay with taking things that are not theirs, telling things that are not exactly the truth, and then be sure that you don't tell something that's not exactly the truth in front of them. And then, I lost my place. Taking something that's not theirs, telling something that's not the truth, and disobedience to parents. Now that's how you get conviction for sin. And then you lead them to this little simple gate. Salvation is a gate so simple that even a child can open it. And this is the best gate to go through I know. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you, you can tell a child this, you can say, if I were to come to your house, I knock on the door, and supposing I call your name, Susie, Billy, and supposing you knew my voice, and you say, that's Pastor Worley. If the door was closed, I was on the outside calling your name and knocking, you were on the inside. If you wanted me to come in, what would you do? Well, a child will quickly tell you, I'd open the door. And then what would you probably do? If you wanted me in, what would you say? Come in. You'd invite me to come in. Behold, I stand at the door, Jesus said, and knock. If any man, and that means any boy or girl too, hear my voice and open the door, that's inviting him in. He said, I will come in. Now, you also have to establish that Jesus would not lie. That if he said he would come in, just as surely as they do what he says in his word, just that surely Jesus will do his part. If you open the door, he definitely will come in and get them to repeat a prayer. This will work with big folks amazingly well. Until I trained with the child evangelism people years ago, I knew 17 roads to get to salvation. And you know, after I trained with them, I dumped all of them for this little simple thing here because it was so simple a child could understand it, and I found out that most adults could even figure it out. They might get lost in your theology going down the Roman road, but they'll never get lost on this one because it's so very, very simple. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you open the door and ask Jesus to come in, he will. And you can lead them through a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you here and now, come into my heart. Save me from all my sin. If you believe that, he'll come in. And little children can have very definite experiences with the Lord. And they don't have to wait till they're grown up to get saved. And they shouldn't. But you'll, you'll be surprised how many children around your neighborhood that I guess we better scrape up some wordless books around here and show you how to use the wordless book. It's four little pieces of colored paper, and you can win any child of the Lord in about less than five minutes using that piece of, those four little pieces of paper because they tell this story pretty much. And children are fascinated by the thing, and it's simple, it's biblical, and it works. And what brought that to mind was thou shalt not steal, 
and thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Uh oh. Wife, manservant, maidservant, his ox, his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. In other words, keep your cotton picking eyes off. Don't reach over there wanting somebody else's things. Because the first step, when you covet, you can move out and start doing something dishonest. Try to get it, or if you don't, you can go around and say, well, they probably didn't deserve it. Anyway, they probably did something dishonest to get it. Sour grapes. Just don't do it, and then you won't have to even start that sort of thing. And all the people saw the thunderings, the lightnings, the noise of the trumpets, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Well, I imagine so. As we said this morning, the volcano going off there. Would you like to stand close and see it real close? You want to run up close and see it? And one time when I was very young, and much more foolish than I am now, when I was younger, I was built for speed. Now I'm built for comfort. But when I was much younger than I am now, I came in one time. I was supposed to preach at a church down on the Texas Gulf Coast. My parents lived in Houston at the time. And I was driving down to go down and preach at this little church. And it happened to be right on the Gulf. And they had a hurricane coming in. Well. I was on the way down there and I was listening to the radio and the wind and the rain was getting worse and worse and worse and, and so I'd been through several hurricanes back in Houston but I never had seen one real close and uh, so finally I went over to the place where the little church was and it was all boarded up everybody was fleeing as a bird to get away from there and uh, they weren't going to have church that morning so I turned around and started back to the highway and about 50 miles down the road to the coast from Houston is, a, is an island called Galveston. It's an island. under Most of the land is under sea level. We've got a big seawall around the whole thing. And the ra I got to listening to the radio. I was going back home. And the rain and the wind was hitting. And the little old, I was in a little old Ford, and it was just bouncing all over the road. And everybody was just zooming, going and getting out of there and coming, uh, going out of the, away from the coast because that thing was coming in, the hurricane was coming straight in over the island. And I got to that highway and I had the most unbelievable urge that I never had seen a hurricane up close. And wouldn't that be interesting to go see it real close? And I started out, and I turned, started going toward the coast instead of the other place, and I was the only car going that way. All the other cars were zooming like crazy going the other way. And I was just, I was just putt, putt, putting along, and heading right into that storm and the rains and things got so bad and when the when the palm trees came blowing down through there and a signboard or two went bouncing across the, the thing I decided I wouldn't go over on the island I turned around and went back but that was like I said that's when I was young and very adventurous now I wouldn't be quite that adventurous these people weren't very adventurous either they backed off from that smoking volcano and they were, Moses told them to fear not in verse 20. Well, they told Moses, said, speak thou with us and we'll hear, but don't let God talk to us because we'll die. They thought they wanted to have a great, good, close relationship with God, but when he got thundering up on the mountain, they decided, uh-uh, you talk to us. We don't want to, <laughs> you, you tell us what God says. We, we're afraid to talk to him. He, we'll die if we listen to him. And Moses tells them, Fear not, for God has come to prove you. Well, they weren't checking out too well, were they? That his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. God's letting you know that you'd be better off not to cross him. His law is like a smoking volcano exploding, erupting. And I want you to know, these people that want to bind yourself to live under the law, Oh, I've got all my righteousness under the law. I want you to know that Sinai was a frightening place. And everybody but Moses was scared to death. Because there's no mercy in law. You realize that? No mercy in law. 
The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And Moses tells them, God wants to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that you send out. The people stood afar off. Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. There wasn't a big long line of people saying, let me go too. I want to go up there. I want to get up close. No, uh -uh. they were backing off the other way. He said, you go ahead, Moses. We'll pray for you as you go. And the Lord said to Moses, thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, you've seen that I've talked with you from heaven. You shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth shall you make unto me, and sacrifice their own burnt offerings, peace offerings, sheep, oxen, and all places where I record my name. And I will come unto thee and bless thee. And if you make me an altar of stone, you'll not build it of hewn stone, for if you lift up your tool and you've polluted it, neither shalt thou go up by steps to mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered there. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, you can't do anything to make me something. I've already made it. I don't need anything, the creation of your hands. A lot of people get the idea, you know, well, I'm really God's little apple. If it weren't for me, God would really be short-handed. Friend, he'd never miss you. But I'll tell you one thing, we really, we'd really miss him if he wasn't around. You see, God doesn't need us, but we desperately need him. Desperately we need him. He can do without us. Listen, he ran the whole universe and created the whole thing when you and I weren't even around. He's still running things. He still, he, he, he wrought the marvelous plan of salvation, and he didn't ask you or me a thing about it. He didn't consult with anybody, and he devised this whole unique and marvelous thing. God does not need us, but he chooses to want to include us in his plan. That is a, a staggering thing when you realize how little God needed us. He didn't need us at all, but he deliberately in his economy, he made a place for human beings because of his love and his grace to show his grace to them. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And it's the grace of God is the reason we're in this thing all at all. God doesn't need us. We'll never be able to do things for him. We can only come to him and surrender and let him work through us. And as he works through us, then the blessings come, the power falls, and the miracles are accomplished. And wonder of wonders, he credits our account in heaven for being used of him. And yet it's all him. It has nothing to do with us per se. We're just merely a part of his plan, and he's included us by his gracious mercy and his will. Aren't you glad you're included? I love you, Lord Jesus. I praise you, Lord Jesus. I worship you, Jesus, my God and only King with all my heart. Jesus, with all my soul, with all my mind, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord Jesus. I praise you, Lord Jesus. I worship you, Jesus, my God and only King, with all my heart, Jesus, with all my soul.
If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure, wouldn't you like to do it tonight? A boy, a girl, a man, a woman, a young person, you can settle it tonight. All you need to do, we've already gone through the plan of salvation. If you're not certain about your relationship, you can't get it settled. Don't hesitate to come forward and just say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to do. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress. You're talking about the work of demons who need to be cast out in Jesus' name. And there are workers here who can help you. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils. Speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. These signs follow believers. And we believe in this. We have workers trained to help you in all these areas tonight. And if you have a need tonight, when we uh, stand in a moment to sing the invitation, then by all means come. Come down the center aisle and receive help. Workers move to the side aisle so we can get the people helped as quickly as possible.